My name is Manuel Edwards. I am the uh, build engineer and manager of the build and, the, and release team at E-Trade. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I have uh, uh, always been interested in computers since a very young age. Uh, I came to the United States uh, uh, several years ago, as you can hear by my accent. So if you were wondering, I am from Mexico City, from Mexico. Uh, I got my uh, degree in computer science from Binghamton University. And uh, I've been doing this uh, whole DevOps thing for a while. And I have uh, learned a lot along the way. So that is it about me. Uh, before we move forward, I will have a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping things to do, uh, because uh, I work for a financial company. There's uh, certain things that I have to say and certain uh, questions that you might be asking me at the end of the presentation that I won't be able to answer. Hopefully, I will be able to answer everything as much as possible to help you in uh, your journey. Uh, so, uh, But before we move to that, let me give you a preview of what's going to happen. Uh, this is the general agenda of uh, what I'll be talking about today. Uh, it's a loosely coupled presentation. Uh, so each one of those four modules that you see up there, uh, they relate to each other, uh, but uh, they are loosely coupled. I thought the four most important things to get uh, continuous delivery implemented in an organization. Not that we have done that completely, of course, but uh, I'll try to tell you as much as uh, what we have done and what I have learned. Uh, uh, so this is the, uh, what I was talking about earlier, important disclaimers. Whatever I say in here is not financial advice at all. So please know that. Uh, and this is just my opinion on technology and how technology can be used and maybe should be used, and uh, especially within, of course, uh, uh, risk-averse organizations. If you are interested in delivering a product that is high quality and you want to do it fast, but at the same time, you want to do it in a very safe way and keeping people in suits very happy, and lawyers very happy, then these are the ideas and my opinions. And that's it. Uh, so who's E-Trade? Uh, uh, how many of you have a retail brokerage account here? Uh, meaning that you can obviously buy. And how many of you have an E-Trade account? OK, so it more or less matches the, uh, uh, the reality. We are the third largest player on the space. Uh, uh, we have over a thousand accounts or so coming in every month. Uh, we were actually the first company to enable a retail investor place an electronic trade back in the 80s. Uh, so we've been doing this whole technology thing, internet, since the uh, mid 80s. Uh, so we've been around for a while. We've been the uh, pioneers in a lot of technologies, and that has been great and has also been a curse because we had to deal with a lot of problems with respect to technology before anybody else had to. And uh, to be honest, sometimes the solutions that you come up first are not the best solutions, but they're the solutions that you have to live with for a long time. Uh, so let's get started. Configuration management. Uh, before we move forward, I want to tell you that I hate configuration management. I, I hate the word specifically, configuration management. And I'll, by the end, you'll see why configuration management is put there. Uh, I should have put quotes around it. Uh, but uh, also, uh, as I move forward in the presentation, uh, you should know that a lot of these things I have invented, it's nothing that you will have heard from uh, a lot of the excellent books that are out there. Uh, so some of them, uh, uh, something that you'll see for, uh, later on, the shapes of uh, change propagation, that's my invention, and also the different new metrics uh, things that you can measure that are really relevant. Uh, and finally, before I dive deep into everything, I want to change the tone of all the presentations that we've been seeing. Uh, a lot of the stuff has been uh, uh, very uplifting. A lot of the uh, presentations have been about uh, people doing great. And a lot of times when I used to come here in previous years, in those last year and uh, different iterations of this gathering under different names, I used to feel depressed because people were coming in and telling me, I can deploy an application from my cell phone, and I can trigger a bill from my toaster. And I'm thinking, within 
my environment, that will never happen. Uh, for many reasons, right? Whether it's, you can blame many different external forces, whether it's audit, whether it's uh, regulations, uh, whether security lawyers, uh, just the inertia, technical depth, uh, senior management, uh, or the weather, anything. Uh, but uh, so what I want to tell you a lot about that I'm going to talk about in here is our failures. So that's right. I'm going to talk about the failures that my team and my company has gone through to learn things the hard way, so you don't have to. OK, so let's uh, take a story time. And as I mentioned, uh, the uh, company has been for a long time. And uh, back, in the, back in the early 90s, in the mid 90s, actually, uh, we had a unique problem where we were growing really fast. And we wanted to maximize our investment in hardware which means that we were buying really expensive boxes and we wanted to squeeze in as much uh, uh, intelligence and bits, basically, that we put, that we call in them. This was before the days of uh, virtualizations or containers that are great tools nowadays that have been created by people that specialize just in that. So part of our solution was to uh, create a framework that we could utilize to uh, divide up an environment, a Unix environment, and we ported it to Linux shortly afterwards, that will allow us to deploy logical pieces of an application independently from each other uh, with environment segregation. Uh, this was kind of the most uh, bare-bone versions of containers you can imagine. So we could actually have two different versions of Apache running on one machine at the same time without any problems whatsoever. Uh, we could have uh, uh, different parts of different applications that are not related to each other at all into one machine deployed into one part. We also wanted to uh, uh, make a commodity out of uh, application management. So if we were going to have thousands of entities, basically, whether they are uh, Apache servers, databases, application servers, middleware, middleware uh, ser uh, 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 deployments, or even backend functions such as uh, uh, trading engine and so on, uh, we, want them, we wanted to have a set of engineers that could be easily trained and that you could tell them, this is the one command that you will use everywhere to stop that thing, whatever it is, whether it's a database server or a web server and so on, right? And as I'm telling you all this, you might be thinking, that sounds great. It sounds like a, a, a great framework to have, and it was great. And when you learn it, you will you learn to love it. But uh, uh, that was our challenge back then. So we started the effort, we did all that, and it was basically like climbing a mountain. And uh, I'm using this analogy throughout the rest of this little module because I think it's very relevant, specifically like climbing Everest. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie uh, Everest or read the book Into Thin Air or are familiar with the whole story of uh, uh, going into the Himalayas and everything that's involved. Anybody knows all about that? Am I the only crazy person that reads that? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, you just stay up here. <laughs> I can't see your faces individually, so that's why I came down. I wanted to have some uh, contact with the audience, but uh, never mind that. Uh, <laughs> so yes, the, uh, uh, the effort was to create this huge framework that we had all these ambitions for in the 90s, and we came up with this uh, shell-based framework that will allow us to have all these wrappers around how we manage applications, all of these metadata abstractions, and if the tiers on how we segregated the application were all also mapped to the architecture of the actual application. So it was great. So you might think that we were successful in our endeavor of climbing Everest, uh, that we were about to get to the top of the mountain. Uh, so one of the first explorers were up there. But the question is, uh, were we successful? And that should have been uh, down there, that question mark, by the way. Uh, success. So what happens? Uh, ah, the 
foreseen side effects. When you are climbing Everest, once you get past 25,000 feet, uh, you get into what is called the death zone. The oxygen level drop down, and uh, you start, uh, at best, uh, your uh, uh, reasoning goes down and you feel like you're drunk. And that's the best, best case scenario. Of course, that, that's not very conducive to uh, uh, performing uh, uh, high exertion and uh, uh, cardiovascular activity, of course. Uh, so something similar happened in here. Uh, when we started going crazy on our configuration and we get into the side effects of what we call configurationitis. This is the equivalent of uh, high altitude sickness, I would say. Uh, so we were climbing up the mountain, we get up there, and what happened is that we realized that we got in deeper that we really wanted to be in. Uh, then suddenly we had literally tens of thousands of metadata configuration points, all of which had to be configured for every single environment that we were moving through. So that gets multiplied uh, geometrically every time that you decide to add a new environment. And not only that, you have to marshal all that information from one environment to the other. And that becomes terrible. It's a recipe for disaster because uh, at any single point in time, you make a mistake. Uh, and that was one of the main problems. I realized that this beautiful configuration framework that we had had given us as a side effect. Uh, also, we wanted to get to the top of the mountain basically uh, on one go, which is uh, uh, in the analogy of uh, going up Everest. Uh, for those of you who have read the book or maybe seen the movie, I haven't seen the movie, but I've read the books and I have read other things. Uh, you don't go in one go. You actually get up to base camp, you stay there for a while, you kind of uh, acclimatize. Uh, you go up to base camp to, to camp one, you come down again, you maybe go up to camp one again, stay a couple of days, come down, and you keep repeating that. You have this kind of uh, continuous delivery approach to climbing the mountain. You don't try to do it all at once, otherwise you die. Uh, it's true. Uh, but uh, we didn't do that with our environments, and we were treating the environment as one big entity. And that was a recipe for uh, disaster. Even when we started doing continuous delivery uh, a few years ago, uh, what we encountered was that we really had continuous downtime because all of environments were inherently atomic. You could only deploy to the whole thing at once. And it was very, very difficult, given our configuration framework, to break apart an environment and say, oh, you, I only want to go on one side before, or I want to do a kind of release. Uh, you couldn't do it. You had to change the plumbing of the building, basically. Uh, the other thing is that when we were describing all of these metadata tables that I explained to you that later on became to be a nightmare, uh, we at least thought that we had a really good definition of our data and how it described the state of the system as a whole. So you could look at all of each trade, uh, all of the different applications, the website, the uh, uh, server-side components of the mobile applications, the customer service uh, applications, anti-money laundering, everything that you can imagine that you don't even think about that a particular company like Itri might need, everything was describable and you could make grabs out of them and it was really awesome. But the problem was that that's only if people are following the convention. Uh, so our model, even though it was truly orthogonal, uh, this is a word I was advised to kind of back off from during the presentation, but I'm sure you guys can take it. Uh, so it meant that it had ambiguities in it, right? There were more than one path to do something, whereas uh, we couldn't really, uh, if we wanted to migrate away from the system, if you didn't have an orthogonal system, it means that you have to do a lot of manual translation, basically. You couldn't write a system to translate your system into another configuration system, for example. And that was one of the problems, and one of the problems that we still have. So uh, this is one of the uh, uh, failure stories, as I told you, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, so obviously, what we needed at the end was uh, the configuration management share pass. We had a whole team of people that whose sole job was to help carry configuration data and create new configuration data uh, for all of the applications that we were deploying. And that was obviously uh, not a very good idea. Uh, so let me quickly look at my notes here. So then how do we solve this? Uh, how, how did we try to at least solve it? Or I should say, actually, so 
to be completely honest with you, uh, what is the process that we're currently undergoing to solve it? Because as everybody's mentioned, it's a journey, so that's exactly what we're doing right now. Uh, well, uh, one of the things that we did is uh, we realized that configuration management is a mistake. And this is something that I've been trying to evangelize for a while now. And that's why one of the main things that I told you why this section should have it in quotes. Uh, configuration management is a mistake. And nobody in this room should be doing configuration management at all. What you should be doing is standards management. And what that means then is you set production standards and for any deviation of that, because there will be deviations, because only production is production, is production. Only product, then you need to then set those exceptions in uh, whatever system you're working with. And that's what you manage. You manage the exceptions instead of the configuration. Uh, that was a problem with our uh, configuration of the leaf that I was talking about. This will be configuration at the root, basically. Uh, or at the trunk, whichever way you want to see it. Uh, the second part is uh, you need to set up base camps. You need to debate and concur. Uh, in the analogy of our monolithic environments, we need to set up availability zones. Uh, so something that we have done already is that we went back, look at the existing framework, and we didn't decide we we're going to boil the ocean, we're going to move away from this. No, we can't do that. We need to be incremental about this. We need to see how we can extend the current framework to support uh, segmentation of the current environment that is currently atomic. Uh, so we did that, and that has actually been very helpful. And we are thinking of taking this idea to whichever environment uh, and configuration management tool that we're going to be using later. Secondly, you need to eliminate waste. And this is obviously some of you, of you guys who are familiar with Lean Principles and so on, and most, a lot of the books that are the fantastic books that are out there, you're familiar with some of these phrases. Uh, so you have to lose the, redund the redun redundancies. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the way to do that is to ensure that there's only one way to describe state. And this is what I meant about uh, orthogonality and so on. Uh, if you start basically giving the user a lot of power, and the user means the developers, a system integrator, whichever way you want to see it, to describe things as far as configuration management, uh, you won't have any standards, and any migrations in the future will be a mess as you grow and grow and grow. Uh, so you need to find a way of unambiguously describing state, whether it's by enforcing of configuration management standards or, st or standards management. Uh, uh, and if you don't do that, you will end up uh, with a lot of uh, terrible migrations in the future. Uh, next is you need to learn to delegate the uh, configuration management. Uh, the problem with metadata and configuration points is that they are not all created equal. And that is what we thought at the beginning when we started doing that uh, framework that I talked about earlier. We thought all configuration points are the same, uh, but they are not. An example of that is, for example, uh, JVM parameters uh, to a particular Java application. And those particular parameters might be relevant to the developer, might be relevant to other very people internally knowledgeable about the application. But for external dependencies, for other applications that are using that particular Java application, whether it's a web servers or anything else, they don't care about that. They just care about your external interfaces, about your contract with the outside world. And this is important even later on when you want to move to things like Docker. So you need to really differentiate between your entry points to your application, your contract to the outside world, and the configuration points that are completely internal to your application. And you need to configure your own internal points and make sure developers are taking care of those themselves. Uh, one of the big mistakes that we had was that we had a different team managing those configuration points. So if a developer wanted to increase the uh, logging level in an application, then you have to send an email to somebody, to a different team, get into their ticketing system, wait for that change to be checked into source code, wait for that change to be built and deployed, and finally, your logging level can go up. You have to involve at least three people to do that. 
And that's crazy. You just want to have more logging for your own use. Uh, so that's one of the, obviously, an extreme example of uh, delegating configuration tasks. But of course, you need to have a line. And that's what I'm telling that it's an art. There is no uh, a clear guideline that I can tell you. It's going to vary depending on your um, uh, architecture. So next, uh, we're going to move from here into change propagation. And this is a good segue because I'm talking about in here into how we are pushing uh, configuration changes. So change propagation is uh, actually a topic I really like on, on like uh, configuration management. Uh, and this is a topic where I have uh, invented something that I call the, the change propagation shapes. Uh, and I think it's very useful to help communicate the strategies uh, into how to build an efficient uh, continuous delivery pipeline and to co how to communicate this to uh, uh, senior management and to even uh, uh, what I call people in suits, like lawyers and you know auditors, internal and external, and so on. So that was very helpful uh, for us to be able to move. Uh, the first thing is uh, you have all heard of uh, value stream analysis and um, value, value stream mapping. And how do you do that? And how you start looking at your application, basically like uh, people used to the manufacturing where your information flows and so on, right? Um, but the problem is a lot of the examples that I've seen of uh, value stream mapping tend to be very high level. And when you start doing value stream mapping at a very high level, you tend to lose a lot of the details. So this is a practical tip right in there of uh, something that you should avoid when you're implementing continuous delivery. It's going to be very tedious, and people are going to tell you that you're overanalyzing things. But you have to do deep value stream mapping. What that means is that when you're thinking of a process uh, that you're trying to map out, you really have to imagine the flows of information and the transactions between people that have to take place for that to happen. You can just put in a box and say QA. That's that, that, that probably the worst example of it, right? Uh, so on the right of this slide, there is an example of a map that is the value stream map for pushing a change to production once it has been built and approved and everything else. Basically, the change is ready to go. What do you do next? Normally, for somebody else, this value stream map might be you have the change here, it's done, it's been approved, it's ready to go, push it to production. So for some people, this might be just two states and an arrow connecting them, right? Well, we have to really deep, think deep about it and see what goes on into that particular change to really get a good uh, uh, value stream map of that change. So this is a true value stream map of that change. And that's what I mean by deep value stream mapping. And why would you want to do that, first of all? Why would you want to go to that tedious process? Well, once you finalize a deep value stream map, what you find out is that, and you probably know this from before, is that all of your environments that are leading up to production are an approximation, obviously, right? Uh, are an approximation of where production is. And therefore, the value of those environments if the value of those environments relies on the testing, then the value of those environments is only uh, directly proportional to how good of an approximation they are. And how good of an approximation they are is uh, a function of how close uh, of all of these steps that you're moving and how does the information change as they move to one environment to the other. So, the, uh, and, and the reason for that is, of course, you realize that the production environment is the only one where value is generated for the enterprise that you're working for. Everything else, in reality, doesn't matter. Production is the only thing that matters. The testing environments are only there to ensure that your production environment is a high-quality environment. And people have to remember that. We always forget that. The only thing that matters is production. And therefore, your approximations have to be as close to production 
as you can. And what happens then when you start looking at those information flows in your value stream map is you realize that the strategies of uh, information movement, basically, of the flow of, uh, between code and bits, promoting code between different points on your value stream map uh, lead to a decrease in the quality of the approximation. Therefore, you have to promote the bits. That's the other thing. It's a practical tip. As much as possible, forget about promoting code. And what I mean by promoting code is the use of uh, different branching technologies that you might be thinking of using or different branching strategies. Uh, as much as possible, you should encourage your development organization to use mainline development. Um, that's something that uh, earlier today Gary Gruber was talking about about how everybody thought he was crazy when he said that everybody had to do mainline development only. That is true. And I have come full circle on that. Before, I used to think that branch-based by, branch development was the way to go. And we have a project on that. And it is probably one of the biggest mistakes that I've made. And some people love it, but I'm telling you, the, uh, the quality of the environment upon which you're de deploying your branch-based code is far less than it could be if you were deploying a mainline product on them. It might be very good, right? And that's the problem with a lot of branch-based development outfits. You build your branches, you create products out of those branches, you deploy them to a testing environment, testing environment looks great, but guess what? That is a completely different product than what you're eventually going to have in production. And like I said, the only thing that really matters is production. So if you are doing branch-based development and you are pushing branch-based builds into some testing environment, just keep that in mind. The only thing that really matters is production. So what's the value of this testing environment? Can I build the quality that I'm delivering with this branch into the main line and therefore increase the... Uh, efficacy of my approximation that I'm achieving at this particular testing environment. And that is exactly what happens, especially with long-lived branches. I will forgive people who use branches for a short period of time, maybe want to build a feature very quickly, but the value of a branch will decrease the, uh, uh, as, as it ages. That, that, that's, that's what it says, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly what it says. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that the more that the branch stays there, your approximation that you're deriving of that branch gets worse and worse with respect to production. So you should stay away from that as much as possible. Long, long leg branches are evil, basically. Next is the... Uh, change propagation shapes that I was talking about. And this ties in exactly with this whole concept of promoting the bits and uh, promoting the source code. So there are two main shapes, actually. There are a couple of more, but uh, I'm not talking to them about any here. For some reason, the uh, uh, names of the environments got uh, messed up in the presentation. I'm sorry, there should be uh, some uh, names there with uh, environment names where you can actually see that more or less okay. So on the left hand side, you'll be able to see the staircase shape, which is a typical shape that a shop that is using long lived branches might have. You will have a branch, for example, for development or an integration branch, and then you might have a long live release branch or a production gold branch. Um, and what happens is that you do your development in your DVL, in your development branch, or to your team branch, you merge them into an integration branch, and eventually gets promoted into a release branch. And what's happening in every, in every level is that you have a pipeline for each product that you're building off from that branch. And the value of that pipeline is only really uh, useful for that particular product that you're building. That's why there are different colors. On one side, you have one product built from that particular code, and the other one uh, from different branches, right? So what happens is that not only your metadata is different, because by definition, different environments will have different metadata, but your applications are completely different as well. So you really have diminishing approximation, and therefore diminishing value overall for the business. And what happens on the other shape, on the slide shape, is that you have uh, 
slide. And you're going to take the same product all through your pipeline, no matter what, from development to production, but you can just let it slide and go down directly to production. Obviously, you need to have a gate or something that will allow you to uh, gate quality. And that is the uh, uh, testing piece to DevOps and continuous delivery. So the advantage of this shape, of course, is that your metadata is still different. So that delta between your environments, between your approximations, will always exist. But your application is the same. And therefore, you're getting more value out of those environments that you have out there. Uh, so that is the uh, uh, shape of uh, change propagation. And if you currently have in your organization a staircase model, uh, it's not an easy migration, and that's something that we're currently dealing with. Uh, especially older legacy code, uh, such as we have in Etrick, quite a bit of it, it's probably stuck forever into a staircase model uh, because of uh, how changes are uh, architecture for that particular for those particular piece of code. However, for the newer pieces of code that are coming into your organization, any new projects, you should uh, think of adopting a uh, slide shape uh, right off the bat, uh, which means obviously that you're going to have, if not uh, mainline development, you're going to have very shortly branches, or you are going to have continuous reintegration into a mainline branch from which is the only one that you're going to be making builds from. Uh, next. so. Uh, Finally, uh, this is the final slide on the change propagation side. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, problems, more problems that we encounter with a uh, staircase model. So I already talked about uh, uh, the uh, configuration IDIS, which is what happened with our configuration management framework that uh, we thought was awesome. And to be honest, if it wasn't for a few things, it would have been really awesome because it really did achieve a lot of things that the containers did, and it really did serve as well for a long time, uh, but it didn't scale, obviously. Uh, on the change propagation side, its equivalent is environment iris. What is that? So what happens is when you have all of these different environments, as I mentioned before, uh, let me try to go back. Uh, when you have the DVL environment and then the next environment, you might have uh, did and sit and then the UR and production, for example. You test in one step and everything looks great. You go to the next step and people say, it's not working anymore. What happened? My applications are working. It broke everything. The, the whole environment's broken. We need to add some sort of validation before we move forward. And the idea that comes around and I you shiver thinking from it, is let's put another environment. Let's put another branch where you can integrate your code before it moves into the next environment. So the answer to environment instability becomes create more environments, create more of these steps to the ladder so that the next step might be, be better off. And that's obviously co mi uh, missing the point uh, completely. Uh, uh, so. Obviously, the answer to, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the main symptom of environmentitis is that people in your organization will tell you that you need more environments. Uh, the answer is never more environments. The answer is never more branches. Uh, and what you need to do is, uh, and what I've been doing at Itrade is uh, uh, partnering with people and explaining to them why that's not the answer. And even business people tend to understand this intuitively. Uh, an example of that is a story I can tell you. We, launch, we are launching a whole new uh, set of products uh, to uh, our main website. We are redoing a lot of the main pages of the, our top strategic pages. And what we're doing there is uh, we wanted to do it in a canary roll release, in a canary release mode. Uh, and that was actually dictated by the business, but they didn't call it canary release. They didn't know how to call it, but they have the intuitive knowledge, all of these practices. They just don't have the language to communicate this to engineers. Uh, so one of the things that I've been doing to um, uh, talk about configuration management and change propagation is uh, introduce the language to them and show them how a lot of these ideas is something they may have been thinking of from before. And the same thing comes to 
uh, people on the risk management side, uh, auditors and so on, that might be thinking this is a, a whole bunch of crazy people getting together in a hotel and they're like a cult, basically. The DevOps people continue to deliver people. But what you need to do is explain to them that all of these concepts are actually things that they already might be thinking about, and sometimes they're common sense. Uh, um, my, my family sometimes asks me about what I do, and I explain to them about continuous delivery, and they look at me like, why does that need to be a thing? Isn't that obvious that when you put something out there, you won't change the whole thing at once? and uh, you will test it well, and you will try to automate as much as possible. So a lot of people you'll be surprised that are not actual engineers will actually be more receptive to continuous delivery than actual engineers. Uh, and I'll talk to that in a couple more slides about uh, software engineering disciplines, which is actually the next uh, little module that we had. Uh, but it's, it's crazy. It's actually the biggest enemies of continuous delivery, I would say, is ourselves. It's engineers. IT people, system administrators, uh, everybody else who's using a computer and who call themselves part of IT is, uh, we are our biggest enemies. If we know how to explain it, everybody else will not agree and say that's common sense. Uh, so anyway, uh, the next point for this is uh, uh, we need to build tools for all those people for uh, risk management, for change management, and so on. And that's what I've learned. That's one of the ideas that uh, uh, Jess Humble has talked about as well. So build tools for them and make them like it. Make them lobby you for the tools you are giving them. Uh, and obviously, you need to uh, uh, certify your, if you're going to a bid based promotion, you need to certify that your uh, bids are good. So you need to set up some sort of certification process for them and be able to sign them. Uh, whether it's RPMs or deliverables, you need to sign them. Uh, what I did for um, uh, implementing continuous delivery at eTrade is I created this. Uh, uh, framework that I call it the DEEM framework. I just wanted to have an acronym that kind of sounded like a word, and they like that, and they ate it up, and it's great, it works, so you're free to take it. So what DEEM means is that you need to define acceptability criteria, and that's what I mean by bid-based certification. That's very, very important. Uh, you need to encourage bid-based promotion. You need to engage internal audit and explain to them that this is just common sense, as I was mentioning. And at the same time, you need to minimize the use of long-lived branches. So in this next part, I'm going to go through uh, uh, fairly quickly. I thought a lot of the points that I'm talking about in this part already about software engineering disciplines. Uh, and the main thing is that you've probably seen this quote already. Uh, and this is very true. And uh, I saw this, and I understood this. And when I saw the quote, it congealed that idea that I had seen before, which really means that if your organizational structure is messed up, you're going to be delivering messed up products. That's it. Uh, what it. And what it really means is that you have to redo the way the organization is set up, even if it's not in the HR sense. Because a lot of times people equate this to, oh, well, I have to have an HR reorganization, create a new team, and give it a new title, and so on, right? An organization is really just made out of the communication links that exist between people. Regardless of whatever hierarchy you see in your, in, in your company's intranet, regardless of whatever title different people have, the true organization is made of communication links. So if you create the partnerships within the other teams that need to be opened up, uh, the good products will follow, and the processes will follow as well. And that's actually the very first thing that you have to do when you want to implement continuous delivery from the bottom up, right? You have to set up some sort of uh, seed example, some sort of campfire. There's a lot of different analogies that are used for that, right? So another thing that uh, was mentioned as far as uh, what you need to do for implementing continuous delivery in an organization is uh, and this was mentioned this morning, uh, a manifesto, HP had a manifesto. We're also doing a manifesto, which is basically a collection of all of these do and don'ts for uh, uh, developers and software engineers uh, as far as discipline goes. And this is the hard part because then you're mentioning to the developers how to do their work. And that is the hardest part, probably. This series of slides is probably the hardest part. It's probably the part that is talked about the most. So that's why I'm going to skip it and get to the automation part, which is the last one. Uh, Finally, uh, uh, software engineering disciplines. Uh, 
you've seen all that. One of the last things that I want to talk in this particular section is the metrics uh, that I set up for measuring better how we're doing. Uh, there's our TMM and all those other metrics that you all know. Uh, there is also build time to runtime verification, which will measure the effectiveness of your development pipeline, uh, which means uh, from the time you start a build to the time you can verify an environment, uh, uh, whether it fails or not, uh, if it fails, ho how long is that time? And from runtime verification uh, to uh, fix build start time. Not only when somebody checked in the code, but to the time that you determine the issue, to the time that somebody checked in the fix, not to the time that it got fixed, because that's RTMM, right? So this is uh, runtime uh, run verification uh, to build, basically. And uh, build failure to build success. And this is uh, RTMM specifically for builds uh, only, for build-related problem. So when you actually use these three uh, metrics, uh, you can make a triangle uh, because they are actually, if you think about the process and uh, the value stream, this will actually be the only three possible paths that you can take. What you want to do is minimize the error of this triangle. So you can measure them, make, take the error of that triangle, and minimize that. And that's a really good metric, actually, that I've encountered, uh, is the triangle of deployment agility. And uh, that's another one of my uh, little crazy ideas that you can take away. Uh, finally, let's go to automation. And this is specifically uh, talking about electric flow, which is what we have been using to uh, supercharge the delivery uh, at E-Trade. And what I did is I partnered up with a particular team first a couple of years ago, which is a uh, from a product that many of you might not know, uh, we are also uh, actually the number one in this space uh, of uh, managing uh, stock plans that different companies uh, put out there. Uh, so if you are an Apple employee, for example, we manage the stock plans. Uh, we provide the product, the applications to manage, for Apple to manage the stock plans. Now we have a lot of other companies, and we're the number one vendor in that space. So for the, for the particular side of the business that's putting our, uh, that product, uh, I help them uh, enable continuous delivery. And uh, what we did is uh, I took all of the lessons that I talked about in the previous slide, uh, simplified configuration management, uh, slide, change pro slide change propagation shape, uh, software engineering disciplines, and obviously putting awesome automation was very important. And what we did is to start automating all of the other parts that talk about, obviously, you talk about automating build and deployment and testing, but there are sort of things that you have to automate. Uh, network level tasks is very important. If you want to have continuous delivery without continuous downtime, you need to automate uh, network level tasks to be able to be nimble on your load balancer configuration. Whatever kind of load balancer, network level routing you have, you need to be very nimble on that, and you need to be able to automate those things very quickly. Uh, you also need to be able to make reports uh, for people uh, that wear suits again. Uh, and you need to then have test aggregation about unit tests, functional testing, and so on, right? So that needs to be automated as well. And what we did is we came up with this little uh, workflow that you see at the bottom, which is the uh, pipeline uh, for the uh, uh, corporate services group, is called. And that is very successful. Uh, we increase the throughput of that team uh, around 1,200 uh, percent. That's uh, one two zero zero percent, um, 120 times faster, and uh, that was revolutionary for everybody in the organization. People could not believe that you could push changes that quickly and that you could keep iterating without causing downtime. And we've been just building upon that success and try to take it one step more and more and more. And that's what we're doing right now. Uh, and that's what has been keeping me very busy lately, too. Uh, so for example, in that pie chart that you see there is the uh, uh, reporting on the continuous delivery pipeline on last month alone. There were, if I can see correctly, uh, about uh, 200 and something successful deployments. Uh, about, uh, and that's a big area. Uh, that's 66% of. Uh, the pipeline runs were completely fine without any problems. Uh, the second part is uh, there was uh, the dark green area is a fail sanity test, which means the build happened fine, unit test happened fine, everything happened well, but when you got to uh, functional test verification, something went wrong. 
and you're able to detect it. But, and that is still really great, because that means that the pipeline went, did what it's supposed to do, right? It, it detected an error and it told you, hey, here's some feedback. You immediately act upon it and rerun the pipeline and make sure this time is green, which is what you want to have. Uh, the second part, the uh, blue part, is, is still very useful. The blue part was a build failure, uh, which I, I don't know how to feel about build failures. I think they're the kind of the lowest common denominator of failures, uh, but uh, they're important to know, of course, and to fix. And the second part are really odd uh, instances, like a one-off of everyone. One of them is a deployment failure, uh, which means there must have been something wrong with all the deployment infrastructure at that point, or something went wrong during deployment, but everything was fine because of all the automated things as far as the network level, for example, how the requests are routed, right? Uh, there was also a failure on the uh, publishing of test code coverage, um, which is not a big deal, but it's there. There was probably something wrong on the Sonar server, something like that. And uh, I don't know the other category, but it's also uh, one of... Oh, no, there's, the other one is really weird. It's a failure on a sleep command that we have. So we let application warm-up come up, and there's a sleep part. Apparently, sleep got messed up for some reason. It couldn't sleep for a while. So I don't know how that happened, but that's only one time out of the couple of hundred, several hundred that we did. Uh, so... That's uh, how we have automated uh, Aditrade, the uh, uh, one of our main flagship products that unfortunately most of you haven't seen unless uh, your company happens to administer their stock plan through our product. Uh, so here are a couple of uh, now uh, practical tips for electric flow uh, usage. And this is something that I mentioned through previous uh, meetings is uh, automation is documentation. Uh, what that means is that, as it was mentioned earlier before, even in other conferences, practices like ITIL want to uh, provide uh, processes by giving you a text document, by giving you a Word document, basically, by telling you you need to document and set standards and so on and put it in a Word document. I have the feeling that that's because uh, the people behind ITIL are not hardcore engineers like all of you people. Uh, so what happens, I think, is that continuous delivery is really ITIL done by real engineers, saying, if you want to do something, the way you're going to document it is by automating it. And when you look at the automation, then you can be guaranteed that's how it's done. So that's what I mean by automation and documentation. Uh, Documentation by itself is just a wish. It's just you wish that people do certain things a certain way. When you have it automated, it will always be done that way no matter what, because computers uh, can't do otherwise. Uh, automation also provides the best audit trail. If you are interested in knowing how particular things were changed, specifically now that uh, thankfully uh, Electric Flow has uh, version management, now we can really see who changed what. Uh, and uh, a couple of more low-level low tools. I'm going to start getting more low-level into uh, flow into this and the rest of the next application in this uh, slide. Sorry. <coughs> um, you need to uh, concentrate on high-quality factory procedures and reusable sub procedures. What that means is that the bulk of your development in electric flow should be done that way. Uh, the reason for that is if you start crafting boutique procedures and workflows for problems, chances are that problem is not very unique. It will happen continuously through the enterprise and it will be redone several times with varying degrees of, um, of uh, differentiation and therefore enforce standards becomes very hard. A way of getting around that is having a factory procedure. If I need to do builds, for example, and builds usually have the same series of steps and they need to follow a certain standard, I have a factory procedure to make build procedures. And if you need to, for example, if you think of a build, you need to package an output, an artifact. You need to create an RPM, for example, the steps involving to create an RPM are always the same, then you can create reusable sub procedures for that. When you start combining those two things, uh, your commander uh, discipline, I'm sorry, your electric flow discipline uh, becomes much better. Uh, 
create tool ownership. Uh, another very good thing is to, uh, and this is my last slide, I'll skip over a lot of these things so I can take some questions, is create your own plugins. That will help you to improve the UI a lot and to make people happy. As I told you, build things for people uh, that make them happy, right? And one of them is uh, when they log into Commander, they see something that they can understand. And making a UI for people, and making a dashboard for them goes a long way. And this is a dashboard that we made for monitoring deployment of patches into different hosts. And it was very easy for people to run a particular workflow and see the state of that workflow based on the, on the um, dashboard that's showing up in there. Uh, backup everything, tight access control, train people, that's very, very important. We had a several, several sessions with uh, uh, Electric Cloud into training our people, and that has been very successful for us. Um, so finally, to answer the question of, uh, or the main topic of the presentation, how Wall Street does continuous delivery? Uh, well, um, it has been thanks to a um, combination of tools and more importantly, uh, talking to the right people and seeing how the value of continuous delivery can be realized uh, through changing culture. And to, when you talk to those people, as I mentioned, you have to let them know that they already have the ideas in their mind. It's kind of like inception. They already are thinking of that. They don't have a language for that. They don't have a framework for that. So your job is to go to the lawyers, to go to internal auditors, to go to external auditors, and tell them that you're just doing what they're already thinking about. And these are the words that you're actually thinking about. It's continuous delivery. And that's, that's what it has, how it has worked at E-Trade. And with that, I'll take uh, questions. <coughs> Anyone? Yeah, I, if I understood the uh, comment was about uh, how continuous delivery practices are actually common sense for a lot of people that are outside IT, is that right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's very true. And it's funny that it, it never really occurred to me on the list until I started trying to explain continuous delivery to family members and other people that are completely removed from this world. And that's when I realized we are just our own worst enemies. And that's why it's so hard to sell this. Uh, you shouldn't try to sell it to other IT managers, to other software engineers. That's when the culture clash happens, right? It's operations trying to tell me how to do my job. Are they going to change the way I'm working and so on, right? That's the only reason there's this whole culture aspect to, the, to this. Other than that, it, you're right. It's just uh, common sense and common, common sense practices, really, to deploying things. Yes. 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 Uh, well, uh, that's a, a very good observation, by the way. Uh, yes, uh, we I we use ele we uh, use electric flow to mapped that out initially. It was just uh, to help us understand what was happening and to help us measure that. It's not something that we normally will do now. Uh, the best way to do deep value flows, uh, the, the, the value mappings, is to get into a conference room with a huge whiteboard and uh, a lot of rooms to redraw things and to redo things. Because as you start doing a deep value mapping, you realize that you're going to end up having to redraw the whole thing over and over again, because the more you think about it, uh, the deeper you start getting into it, and the more you start to rearrange the whole thing. Uh, so using a diagramming tool can help you for certain sections. But yes, uh, we do normally don't use electric flow for anything else other than that initial part. Yeah. yeah. Right. Anybody else? Uh, 
Okay. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope it was useful, and thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day too. Thanks.